Today, I'm going to talk a little bit about contributing to the Rust compiler. Um, so as you've already seen, uh, my biggest fear has come true, and we're having or had some technical difficulties. Um, most of this talk will be uh, somewhat of a live demo. Uh, I don't know if we have really the option, but if you have questions at any point, please speak up and, and say something. Um, I'd be happy to pause and, and answer questions. Um, and then, of course, at the end. But um, a lot of presentations start with and, you know, an introductory slide of, of the speaker. But in the spirit of the talk, I'm, I'm actually going to avoid this and, and start with um, where I started um, with, with Rust. And, and that was actually um, on Chalk in, in late 2019. And if you aren't familiar with Chalk, it's a, um, or was intended to be a definition of the uh, Rust trait system implemented using this generalized Prolog-like um, logic solver. And I started off doing uh, a number of you know, general simplifications and, and fixes to long-standing issues, um, but over the, the course of 2020, and um, really the first... You don't use this, this is right. Yes, yes. This is basic. All right. So that's better. Um, so over the, the course of 2020, um, particularly the first half, the traits working group, which um, it was in charge of the chalk repo, uh, made a lot of progress on chalk itself. Uh, and we did a, a number of sprints, and these were published as, as blog posts. And this was really great for getting um, sort of new contributors in, because a lot of the tasks that we had were, were fairly small. And I, I did a lot of mentorship and ongoing work, and um, during this time I got uh, promoted to the co-lead of the, the Traits Working Group. Um, and, and continuing um, through 2020 and ended uh, the first half of 2021, I did a lot of work on Chalk um, and, and submitted a lot of pull requests, and, and this was quite uh, useful. But uh, you know, switching to the Rust compiler, uh, I want to actually say that I lied. My, my first work uh, on Rust was, was not Chalk. It was actually a couple months prior on the Rust compiler itself. But these pull requests were a little meaningful in that they were uh, just a couple of tests. So these were just issues that had already been fixed, and I just submitted a pull request with adding regression tests and, and uh, closing the issues. And at, at the time, it seemed really big, uh, even though uh, they were not big PRs at all. You know, my first significant uh, uh, changes to the compiler were uh, continuing on my work with Chalk and um, working on the Chalk integration and uh, related work to make the compiler more Chalk-like. And if you sort of look through this list, um, I don't know if you can see with the podium, but yes, that last PR did take six months to get merged. And it got eventually split out into multiple PRs that get merged um, sort of before this one. And I wanted to point this out because oftentimes when we contribute, uh, especially for bigger PRs like this, it, it can take time. And that's something to keep in mind, that it's not always quick. And then after sort of working on Chalk and the compiler and, and doing some of that work, I switched gears a little bit to try to push to stabilize gaps. And I know Josh mentioned this this morning, but uh, in late 2021, in August, we uh, published a blog post essentially saying we wanted to push to stabilize GATS, and I uh, naively put a time frame of, I think, three to six months or something like that, and it took a lot longer than that. So there was a number of big PRs um, solving a number of different bugs and usability uh, concerns, but eventually, the, 
but it did get stabilized in October 2022 and Rust 1.65. And then sort of during that period and in the time since, different things have happened. I, I have done you know, different types of compiler work. Um, the types team got formed, replacing the traits working group, um, which is uh, essentially focused on the overall type system. And uh, the Rust Leadership Council was formed, and I'm a Lang team representative. And so while I started off just doing code, uh, my uh, interest and in, in work on the Rust project is sort of varied and diversified. And sort of with that, we're, we're up to now, right? Um, but you, you might be asking, so what? Why am I telling you about me? I could have just done this in a slide. Well, if, if you think about it, we came a long ways from that first couple uh, pull requests, where all I did was add a couple tests to fix issues, and it seemed like the biggest thing ever. And I wanted to point out you know, all the things I've done, because we all start somewhere, and um, that's sort of why I'm doing this talk today. So. In the time sort of since I first started, a lot of work has been done on the, the Rusty Deb guide. And this guide has a lot of information. Um, it's sort of divided roughly in two parts. The first is uh, information on how to contribute to the compiler, right? So building, testing, uh, what are the different things that you might find when you do contributions. And then the second half is a more detailed compiler overview. And I think Nick has a, a talk on, on Tuesday where he'll talk a little bit about some general things um, on the compiler and how it works. But today, um, this presentation will likely cover a lot of what sort of is here. But um, I'm hoping I'll also give you some tidbits that you may not find in the, in the Rusty Deb Guide. But Maybe they'll get added after this. So uh, just a couple of prereqs here. Um, so first, I'm assuming that you have Git installed um, and that you have it set up for GitHub. So um, importantly, you have to have, uh, if you want to push code, you have to have your SSH keys set up or um, more similar. Uh, second prerequisite is I assume that you have Rust up installed. Um, it's not vital to contributing to the compiler, but uh, there is some things that it's useful for, and, and I'll get to that. Okay, so now is the fun part, because now it's interactive, and I have to put down the mic. Um, so the first step is going to be cloning the compiler, and um, if you go to the GitHub page, um, typically you want to fork it, which will be up here. And of course, I already have my fork. And then you'd go over to code. And then you uh, would have the URLs here. And then you can go and, and call git clone. Luckily, I've already done this. And I have a directory which is um, cloned and, and ready to go. So the next thing to look at, um, and of course, remember, all of this is going to be in the uh, Rusty Dev Guide. Um, is there's a couple of really interesting things to note, note here, particular the, particularly these three files, um, x, x.ps1, and x.py. And these are special scripts that are used to build the compiler. And so if we look and just run slash x, um, the first thing it'll do is it'll download and compile Bootstrap, which is um, the code that essentially runs the compiler um, the compiled building process. But then we want to scroll up, and we want to look to see sort of what commands we can run. And a lot of these you might recognize, and they might be self-explanatory, right? So you have your, your cargo equivalents of build and check. Uh, there's Clippy and format and different things that you might use. Um, but the one we want to start with is actually setup. So if we run x setup, this is going to help us get our environment set up. Um, so maybe I can make the, the code a little bit bigger here. Maybe not. Um, but so the first thing that X setup is going to ask you is what type of contribution are you expecting to make? 
Um, so we could uh, try to modify the standard library. Um, we could try to do tools. But what we're going to do is the compiler. So we'll start with selecting B. The next thing it'll ask is if you want to install a, uh, a GitHub or a Git hook um, to run tidy. Uh, it's helpful. I personally don't do it, so I hit no. And then the last thing is um, whether we want to automatically install the recommended Visual Studio Code settings. And um, I'm going to use Visual Studio Code, and so I'm going to hit yes. OK, so while that's running, or so while that's set up, um, I'm going to go ahead and start a check run just so we know that our compiler is working. And I'll let that run in the background while I uh, continue and get things set up. Um, the first thing that it's going to do is, is clone the, the sub-modules that are in the compiler, um, and that might take a second. So the, the next thing to do, if you've never really touched the compiler before, is to um, install some kind of code editor. I use Visual Studio Code because there's a lot of really good support for both Rust Analyzer and uh, the compiler within Rust Analyzer. Um, and I, I'm not going to go into exact details about how, uh, you know, how you would do that. Um, but once you get it up, you would start up Visual Studio Code. And then um, the first thing we want to do is install Rust Analyzer, which is going to do um, your language server completions and um, you know, give you a more interactive experience. So I go over to extensions, typing with one hand. Um, and then I, of course, already have it installed, but you could select it and, and, uh, and add it. So the next thing is a, a little trick that is um, helpful if you um, are going to be sort of quickly doing compile cycles. And that's to actually tell Rust Analyzer that you want it to build to a separate directory than if you ran it in the command line. So I'm just going to add that real quick, because um, it'll help things move quicker. And it's not required, and it does take up some disk space, but um, it's useful. Not a good place to put the mic. So just two places, the, the check command and then the build command. So then we'll just save it, and that's all set up. So now Rust Analyzer is ready to, to do whatever it needs to do. So we can go back, and we can check, and uh, cloning took some time. We'll see if it works. Maybe not. OK, so next. Give me a second. So as I said, my worst fear was technical difficulties, but I have backups. So now we can see if XPy check worked. And OK, so now it com it, I already downloaded the submodules previously, so it's going to compile it. Um, but we're going to close the terminal and use the one in Visual Studio Code. So I'm just going to do control back tick, and that'll open this um, terminal down below. Um, and then what we can do next is just run xcheck here. Uh, maybe. All right, so now it's running there. So now we have our development environment set up. We have an IDE. We have the compiler. It's going to go through and build everything and get everything ready for us. So the next step is to figure out 
OK, well, what are we going to actually do? So we're going to start with looking at the GitHub and looking at a bunch of issues. So if you go and look at the Issues tab, um, it'll take a second. But there's a lot of issues. So it, you, know, see, you see up here, it says 5,000 plus. I think we're up to 8,900 or something like that, which can be overwhelming. But luckily, the, the Rust project has labeled the issues pretty well. And there's two tags that I want to point out as being, as being really useful to beginner contributors. The first is going to be this E-Easy tab. And these are issues that have been tagged specifically as something that someone who's just starting can probably do. Um, and if you want to be independent and you want to get started, this is probably the easiest thing to do. The next tag is going to be um, e-mentor. And these are not always easy issues. There's a range between easy, medium, and difficult. But what's really nice about these, these issues is they've been specifically tagged as someone saying they're willing to mentor you in solving this, issues, this issue. And sometimes the, the person who's willing to mentor has already written some notes and said, OK, this is how to approach it. Um, sometimes they say, I'm willing to mentor. Come contact me, and, and we'll talk through it. And generally, whoever's you know, written eMentor is going to be approachable for you know, the duration of fixing the issue. And so this can be really nice if you want um, a, a more mentorship, mentorship style or if you want to try to tackle a harder problem. But I wanted to just point out that there's a lot of different uh, labels, as you can see here. And the, the Rusty Dev Guide does have um, some info on what they are. Like, go find the slide. Right, so this is in the Rusty Dev Guide, but I'm not going to go to try to find it right now. But there's a lot of different labels, and they all have a different purpose. But you know, we saw this this E dash easy, medium, hard uh, mentor, help wanted, and these all sort of indicate the the general experience level needed to solve the issue. But there's others like um, what area the compiler relates to. There's blockers, etc. Um, and so if you ever have a question of like, what a label means, this might be helpful. OK, so um, that being said, we're not going to do this. So I already have some experience. And I know of sort of a class of issues that might be good to try to solve today. Um, and in fact, uh, if we, we look for um, this particular search this higher ranked lifetime error. And um, I'll show you a specific example, but um, there's a few issues open here that all, uh, maybe not all of them, but a lot of these have the same sort of really poor diagnostic um, that came out of the LL, NLL uh, migrant mode transition. And the particular issue that we're going to look at today um, was posted a, about a month ago, um, and a lot of a lot of this higher rank lifetime error um, uh, issues end up being very similar and uh, specific type of issue. But I saw this and I noticed it was a little bit different than what I had seen before. So I was like, this looks interesting and also not that bad. Um, and so I went ahead and claimed it, and I said, I'm going to work on this, um, but I'm going to use it for a talk, so it might take a minute. Um, and I self-assigned here, but there's also um, Rustbot commands that you can run if you want to assign an issue to yourself, and, and that's in the guide. So now that we have an issue, um, the first thing that we're going to do is go see if we can write a test for it. Right? So if we go back to um, VS Code, we can also see that our check from completed fine, which is good, because that means that um, our compiler is basically ready to, to be tinkered with. So tests in the compiler are mainly, writ, uh, mainly under this test directory. And there's different types of tests, but the ones that we're interested in are UI tests. And UI tests are basically written in a way that we can track not just whether a test passes or fails, but we can also know if it does fail, 
what did it, the compiler admit? So you might know by now that Rust really prides itself on the diagnostics. And if you get an error, we want it to be helpful. We don't want it to be some unhelpful error like the issue we see today. Um, and so we want to track whether, what those errors are, and we want to make sure that if we um, emit an error, that it's helpful. So there is one specific subdirectory that I think is pretty good. It's this higher rank subdirectory. And so I'm just going to right click and make a new file. I'm going to just name it. And then I'll just paste in the code. OK, so we made our test. It's there. So the next thing we're going to do is tell the compiler to run this test. Um, so we're, for this, we're going to use xtest. And then I'm going to put in the exact uh, test so it doesn't run everything. It just runs this one. All right, so our test is going to run, but first everything has to compile. Um, it's different than check, but uh, while this happens, it's not gonna take that long, but it'll take a couple minutes. Uh, I wanna talk a little bit about the, uh, nope. So this happened yesterday. I know exactly how to fix it. All right, it's going to have to read down the beta, but not a problem. All right, so while we wait for that to, to happen, I want to talk a little bit about the issue and, and go into some of the background of it. So um, this is a relatively recent issue. Like I said, it got posted about a month ago, and um, it's not going to ch it hasn't changed. But oftentimes, you'll find an issue, and maybe it's been posted a year, two years, multiple years ago, and you want to know if it's still emitting the same, same diagnostics. If it's compiling, you know, what's changed? So the most useful link is often the, the Rust playground. Um, a lot of issues will have a, a link to the playground with that filled out. So if we're just going to come over here. And it's pretty simple. So you just put your code on the left, and then you hit, in this case, run. And it'll try to run it. And in this case, we get the error that we don't like. Um, and this is the latest stable, but we can also do um, the latest nightly just to, to make sure it hasn't really changed most recently. It sometimes happens that it does. But uh, this is not entirely useful. If you want to know, has this always failed? Has it compiled before? Has it always been the same diagnostic? And so to use this, or to sort of check this, what we're going to use is a really neat site called uh, Compiler Explorer. And this is a little bit more advanced than the Playground, but it has some nice features. Um, particularly, um, it lets you decide what version of the compiler to use. And even um, there is, I think, support for different code gem backgrounds, uh, backends like GCC. Um, so if you want to test it, that's not useful. But we're going to start with looking at Rust 1.64 which, um, as I sort of mentioned, I knew about this type of error because of my work with NLL and removing migrate mode. So that happened in Rust point uh, 1.65. And so if we look at 1.64 before it got moved, we see while it's not all that helpful on, of an error, it's better than we, what we have today. Right, so you get some hint of you know one type is more general than the other, um, even though that expected found uh, is is sort of bogus. But uh, the next question might be, you know, did this ever work? Right, so if we go back and we can change the version to uh, Rust 1.0, and uh, we can see it it still didn't compile. Um, but I did want to also point out that. The diagnostics have gotten so much better since then. I mean, this isn't that great. Um, so anyways, we now know 
uh, that our issue is probably not going to be solved today, but it might. We'll just have to see. Um, but we also know that the diagnostics have changed, and we can probably make them better if we're, if we're clever. So let's go back to Visual Studio, and it's still compiling, but that's OK. So the first thing I like to do when I'm looking to see um, you know, why an error is getting admitted is I just go to search for the error itself. So if we just do control shift f and we do um, higher ranked uh, error, right? Um, you'll see it actually, we get one instance of the, the actual error. And I wanted to point out here that I'm only including files within the compiler itself. Um, so there's actually a couple tests that are currently admitting this um, that are relatively new from what I've seen. But um, in the compiler, right, the, this lifetime or this, this error is, uh, shows up in one place. And if you look at this, it's not actually a Rust file, right? And I wanted to point out that um, this is because there's been some recent work to actually translate the uh, diagnostics that the Rust compiler emits. So there's a little bit of misdirection sometimes. But the, the way these files are set up is you have a, a set of keys and, and the, the diagnostic that gets submitted, and some of them have variables that can be added. But the next thing we're going to do is just take the key and look up where that is. And you'll find that it's uh, in one place, and it actually annotates a struct. And this struct is essentially um, the error uh, that we're, we're emitting. And I wanted to point out sort of two things here. One is we have a cause uh, field that's annotated with subdiagnostic. And if this is sum, it means that um, there is going to be some extra data that gets emitted. And then we have this primary span, which um, is where the, it actually points to uh, when it outputs. So what we can do is we can look to see where we actually construct the struct. And there's four places all in the same file. But if you look at these, right, so there's predicate query, normalized query, ascribe user type query, and instant, instantiate opaque type. And I don't want you to worry about the details of what a query is or what this type off info. Don't worry so much about it. But I, what I do want to point out here is that for two of these, specifically the predicate query and um, the normalized query, the cause field has a value. It's not none, which means that if it was one of these that was emitting the error, then we would see some extra info, and we don't. So that's an easy and, and quick way to sort of start to narrow down our choice. But then we look at the other two, and both of these have, have none as a cause. So now we have to figure out um, sort of which one it is. We could go in and start doing debugging and you know, figure out where, um, what's getting called. But we can also sort of use a little bit of intuition. And that's you know, looking at what, what the simple is, is uh, implementing type op info for. And the, the second one I want to point out is instantiate opaque type. Now, I know what an opaque type is, but if you were looking at the compiler for the first time and had no idea what this is, you might not know what it is. And so there's different use, uh, resources, but the first thing that I would do is go to the Rusty dev guide, which I already you know, talked about previously, and then I would go up and search um, opaque type. And if you look, um, in fact, a bunch of search results pop up, um, including uh, you know, info really on the, the side of exactly how the compiler works. Um, but as I was going through this, I actually realized that there's not like a single line that actually says what this what opaques ac actually are. Um, you can start to get a little bit of hints, right? So infiltrate makes sense, but could be better. And you know, again, maybe a pull request will make it better. 
But uh, there are other resources that you can follow. And another one I wanted to point out is actually um, this, this chalk book. And we did a lot of work on this um, when we were contributing a lot to, to the chalk code base. Um, and while it has a lot of information on how chalk works, it also has a lot of general information about the, the, Rusty, uh, the Rust trait system and type system and uh, in general how to think about it in, in logical terms. But I, when I was looking around, I saw that you know, there's the second sentence, opaque types are the underlying concept used to implement existential infiltrate and rust. Okay, so pretty clear. Um, and while it's not super useful for this particular bug, it's good to know that it's a resource. So if we go back to our, our, uh, our test, we see no infiltrate here. We also don't see anything where an infiltrate might be, such as an async function. So it's probably not that one. And the only other um, implementation here that might be admitting this error is the subscribe user type query. And this makes sense because in our test, we're actually sort of um, annotating what the, the function uh, call is. So this makes sense. Now, uh, as you can see at the bottom, our test has run. And if we look at the output, it's exactly what we saw in the playground and in the compiler explorer, which is good. It means that we ran our compiler and it's matching what we would expect it to. So this is a good place to start. So the next thing that we can do is to start to figure out um, why this error is getting admitted. So the next thing I'll do is look at fallback error and figure out why, where it's getting admitted or called. And if you look, they get called from the same function, um, so this report error function here or here. And there's two conditions. First is if this placeholder universe is uh, less than the space universe, and then the other is if uh, the call to, to nice error is none. And just as an aside here, going back to the presentation, um, so what exactly is a universe? So what's a, what's a universe and what's a placeholder? So just a couple seconds here. Uh, if you've ever seen a bound or a clause on a function like for tick A, T implements trait of tick A. What you're really saying is T implements trait for any lifetime tick A, right? And internally, when we try to solve this, we represent tick A as an index, right? And so in the, when we do debugging, we might see something like um, T implements trait as uh, tick uh, exclamation point one. But to add a layer of complexity, you can actually have nested higher rank things. So this is a higher rank uh, trait bound. And if you have nested higher rank things, inner types and lifetimes can name outer types and lifetimes, but not the way, other way around. And so to solve this, uh, each time we instantiate a new for, um, the, the types and lifetimes get a new universe index. And so you'll see um, sort of incrementally uh, uh, index values for, uh, for placeholders. So sort of going back to um, our, our code here, we might ask, um, well, which of these is actually happening? And for that, what we can do is uh, log the, the values. And so if you look here, um, there's already some debug statements, right, for base universe. And then um, we use tracing. so. Uh, there's this instrument call that allows, uh, in this case, placeholder error element and cause all to be outputted. And then also even down below, we have placeholder region two. Um, and so to do this, the first thing we're going to do is actually link uh, our uh, Rust up toolchain, um, or link our compiler as a Rust up toolchain. Um, so to do this, I'm just going to call um, Rust up toolchain link, and uh, I'll do this and, and pick up the mic.
OK, so we just linked our toolchain. And uh, if we call Rust-C with that toolchain, we'll see it uses the, the version we've, we've already built. All right, so it's using 1.74 dev, right, which is the, the latest nightly version. So this is good. So the next thing that we're going to do is call Rust-C um, and tell it to log the um, the, the, the debug captures of this crate. All right, so just briefly, Rust-C log tells um, tracing what we want to output. Uh, we're calling Rust-C with the stage one GoSim uh, toolchain that we just linked. We're going to run the specific test file, and then we're going to use uh, bash to redirect our standard out to a log file. And I put it in the build directory so that Git doesn't um, you know, see it and commit it. So then we, we call that, and then we, what we can do is we can open this up. And then we can see if we can find our report error. And we do. And in fact, we only see one, which is going to make things easier. And so now we can start to look around to see um, what might have happened in terms of this execution. So we see um, in the report error, we see placeholder with a universe of two, and then we see the, our base universe debug with a universe of zero. So if we go back to our code and we look at that first um, potential output of fallback error, we see that um, this didn't happen, right? Our placeholder universe is in fact greater than, than base universe, and so everything's fine. So that means that nice error down here is, is probably none, right? Well, it has to be none. So let's go figure out why. So if we go and we, you can use Rust Analyzer to go to the trait, or you can just quickly search. Um, and I know that we want the ascribe user type query implementation, and so we look at nice error. And so... The, the signature for this returns an option. And so we're looking for places that uh, this function might have returned. And there's two here that are worth looking at. The first is um, this question mark here, which means that if this OK call returns none, the whole function will. But if we go back and look at our log, we actually see that we actually call the next function, this try extract error from fulfill context. So that didn't happen. We know it uh, went on from there. So if we go and look at this, right? Um, oh, Rust Analyzer is not working. That's fine. I probably mistyped. But anyway, so if we go to this function and we uh, look at this, there's no place here that can return none except the last one. So we go to the this function and there's a few places in this that can return none, but I'm going to tell you, because uh, I've already looked at this, that it's actually just this first bit. Um, and we can even go and look to see why this is returning none. So essentially, uh, what this code is doing is you have this list of region, region constraints that get added while doing trait solving, and we're trying to find our placeholder in that set of region constraints. And of course, if you go to the log, you can, you can find it here. But I've already uh, made it a little bit pretty so that we can um, look at it without having problems. So our, re our region constraints, if we look, we're looking to see if we have the placeholder with universe uh, 2. And it, there's a few with universe 1 and universe 3, but, but none with 2. And so this confirms what we expected, or you know, might have guessed, in that um, this is returning none. So at this point, 
I knew sort of what the idea was, why it might be going wrong. So the next thing that I wanted to do was figure out, OK, well, why is it not showing up in that list of region constraints? So I did what any you know, compiler dev that's trying to finish their presentation way too late did, and go and look to see where those region constraints are getting generated. And to gloss over a few details, uh, I went into this, this function, and I went down here, and I went to this one, and I essentially went down and found a list of predicates that are the trait solver was essentially trying to solve. And I you know, printed out these for you. And there's a couple things that are sort of missing in this, right? So by default, uh, what are called inference variables get printed as underscores. And so a neat little trick is you can call Rust C with the dash Z verbose option, which gives you a little bit more info on what these are. But looking at this, I was like, this is not going to go very much, uh, very well if I continue down this path. So the next thing that I was going to do was um, figure out, well, OK, where is the error emitted itself? And um, well, where the error was emitted. And I went into this, and I realized this is not the place to go. And it was about here, uh, and maybe a little bit before, that I was really questioning whether I did the right thing by selecting this issue. Um, and I thought, oh no, I'm going to have to change this two days before I have to submit the talk, and it's going to be difficult. Um, but then I realized that it's actually not so bad. And if we go back to our region constraints, uh, and, and I actually have a better slide done here, one of these things is, is not quite like the other. And if we go back to our function, right, and we look at where these variables are coming from, our placeholder region gets passed in to this nice error function, right? So it's coming from somewhere else. But our region constraints get generated during this type op, ascribe user type with span. And so this kind of makes sense, right? It means that when we're generating new region constraints, we're generating regions that we didn't previously see. And the reason we do this is for diagnostics, but there's clearly a bug here, right? There's, we don't have complete reproducibility in how we actually generate these. And I could go and try to figure out why, but this is the diagnostics in the error case, right? The compiler is going to fail at this point. And so we want to try to emit the best error we can, but Sometimes we have to guess, and sometimes we have to be inaccurate. And a bad error that's always emitted is almost always worse than a slightly misleading error that's only sometimes emitted. So what we can do is take a, break, take a deep breath and hack on a little bit. Right? So we already saw that we have very similar region constraints from what we want, right? So we have the same named variable, this underscore variable, but just the, the universe is different. So if we can be a little bit tricky and a little bit uh, clever, we can actually go and, um, you know, coming back to this, right? We can try to be a little bit clever, and when we see a placeholder, Rather than just checking if the whole type's equal, we can just see if the, um, if the, the universe is, is similar. And so uh, if you're not familiar with the, with the compiler, you might not know what the different variants of the regions are, right? And so a useful resource, again, you might find it, you may not, is the uh, Rust C nightly Rust docs. And this is the Rust docs for the compiler. 
And particularly, you can search for basically any type. And so we're going to search for region, right, which is a, a lifetime type. And there's a couple layers of you know, interaction here, but we're looking at the region type. And uh, a lot of things are interned in the Rust compiler, including regions. So we actually really want to look at the, the region kind. And there's another layer of interaction here um, for sort of abstraction. But if we look at this uh, region kind enum, we see that there's a bunch of different variants. And if we look for placeholder region, we find that there is a type alias with a placeholder of some region. And this, it's this placeholder type that has the universe. And so if we go and we try to, uh, if we want to make this error a little bit better, we can you know, match on this error and, and make it better. So what I'll do is I'll actually, um, in the interest of time, what I'll do is I'll just sort of go through the steps that I took, right? So I started with um, something really simple, right? So I just took every single um, time that it tried to find a placeholder in the constraints and just uh, for placeholders made them check only the bounds but not the universe. Um, and this sort of worked, right? So uh, we got a very similar uh, diagnostic than we did prior to uh, 1.65. Right, so we got a, the one type is more general error, which is the most useful part of the error. But if we look at all the other tests, we actually see that it changed others, right? And a lot of these were definitely uh, real diagnostic regressions that we, we didn't want. So the next thing I did was be a little bit more clever. And um, it first does one pass where it tries to see if there's an exact match, and then if not, then it'll do a little bit more lenient. And this got it down to only one other test that, that broke. But if you actually look at the test and you look at the output, um, it's about net neutral in terms of the change, right? So there's some regression in output, some improvement, right? So we get this expected trait send, found trait for to case send, and then uh, we lose the higher rank lifetime error and get a mistyped, mismatched types error. So it's mostly net neutral. And if you look at it, it's in a nightly only feature anyway. So we can, we can take the hit. So the reason why the, the tests are failing is, if you remember, when we run our UI tests, we track to make sure that the diagnostics that we emit, even when the tests fail, you know, don't change. And if we want them to change, and we, we see that it's right, then we need to tell the compiler, uh, yeah, this, this test is right. We, we bless it. So the, the video, I could run the video, but you essentially run these two commands, and it'll replace the you know, expected compiler error with the, the new one. But then we, we try to run it again just to make sure everything worked, and we see that it didn't work. Or it did, just it didn't completely work. And we get this error, right? So we get this unexpected errors from JSON, ex, JSON output. The actual standard error differed from the expected standard error. So this is another step that we take to make sure that we don't accidentally rest things in terms of diagnostics. And if we go back and look at um, some tests, and we look at a similar test, so this one, uh, we'll see that when there's an error, we have this little annotation that says, hey, we expected an error here, and we expected this particular error. And so what we can do is we can add that error exactly, or we can add the, the mismatch types annotation and check, and, and in fact, the test pass. So we have fixed our, our bug, right? As a little side point, um, and when we run CI on PRs, if the formatting doesn't work, you can uh, it won't it won't pass and it won't merge. So you can run X format or 
um, X tidy would also work. But then we have our changes, and we can commit our change with Git, right? So this is maybe not best practice for Git, but um, it's what I do, sorry. Um, so I check out a new branch, name it something useful, I add everything that I've modified, I commit with a message that's helpful, and then I push to my, my GitHub repository, um, and then it shows up. And so at this point, um, I've already done this before. I already have a branch. And so I can actually um, sort of live make a, make a pull request. And we can see um, how that looks. So once you're at a given branch, what you can do is you can go over to contribute. And we can open a pull request. And then... Let's move this to All right, so we change the title and then we'll add fixes the issue number, which is going to be one one four eight six six, which means when it merges, it'll close the issue automatically. And we'll also add a little note. Okay, and then if we want to scroll down and just look to see that you know, our, we had the right changes, right? So we changed this one function where we made it be a little bit more lazy, and we have two passes. Um, and then also in this version, I added a couple other debug statements, and those are always okay, right? It always helps to debug, as long as you're not doing extra work that you wouldn't do if you don't debug, as Nick, you know, Hinted. Um, but then we look at the test changes, right? So this is the one that was already there. And we can, of course, see that, you know, some net neutral changes. And then we add up our new test and the error that we emit. And then we can go up and we can create a pull request. All right, so now it's live. And you can see that there's already been a, a conflict. So that can be maybe resolved, actually. But uh, I'm going to decline to do that today in terms of time, but I'll do it later, and you can go look and see that it gets resolved. But I wanted to point out here that um, the first sort of step when a PR gets opened is Rustbutt comments and assigns a reviewer to you, and then it adds this waiting on review uh, label, and then also tries to add a team um, using what, what files you modify. But um, over the review process, you'll go from uh, it'll sit and wait and review, the reviewer will review and say, OK, back to author. And it, uh, sometimes the cycle will repeat a couple times, where you go from review to edits and back and forth. And then eventually, it'll be in a state where everything's good. And then it'll change to waiting on Boars. And Boars is our friendly neighborhood bot that ensures that everything that uh, gets merged, passes all the CI checks, and then it gets merged, and you have contributed to the Rust compiler. So a couple useful triage bot commands, right? So um, Rustbot already did this when we opened it, but you can do it too if you have a specific reviewer that you think would be best to review your change, or if you have a specific team, you can uh, put the team name. It, to go between the, the waiting on review and waiting on author states, you can use the Rustbot ready or Rustbot author. And then I also figured I include um, some useful Git change or Git uh, workflows that, you know, if you've never used Git before, these are quick and easy. So if you need to make a change, you can do Git add, Git commit, and, and push. Um, if you there's a merge conflict, like there already is, um, since I think two days ago, which is fantastic. Um, you can fetch from the, the origin. You can um, rebase. Then you will fix your merge conflicts. And then you'll tell git continue rebasing. You'll fix your merge conflicts again. And you'll repeat until you get through all your commits. And then you can force push and 
GitHub will open or update your, your pull request. And then, yeah. So to sort of finish it off, um, let's, let's talk a little bit about what if you don't want to work on the compiler, but you want to work on the Rust project? So there's a lot of things that you can do. And maybe I'm in the way, but there's multiple repositories that are not just the Rust uh, repository itself, right? So your favorite tools, Clippy, Rust Format, Rust Analyzer, Cargo. These are all separate repositories that you can contribute to. You can contribute to Rust doc, which is not the compiler itself, but it's in the Rust repository. So you have to go through the same pull request um, process as if you were submitting to the compiler. If you don't want to do code changes, but you want to still make things better for other contributors, um, the Rusty dev guide is a great place to make uh, additions to. I mean, as you see, I, I said some things today that might go in, so maybe a good first, first contribution. But what if you, you want to contribute to the project, but you don't want to code? Well, I want to point out sort of two groups that are not necessarily coding, but do a tremendous amount of work for the project. The first is the, the triage working group, which um, mainly regularly checks on open PRs to ensure that they keep moving and that if a PR is blocked, that that blocking concern you know, gets resolved at some point or uh, a reviewer doesn't forget to review and you know, it, it keeps our pull request relatively low. Um, and more recently, they've started going through sort of old issues and, and closing outdated ones. Because um, as you might see if you go to the repository, we have a lot of issues open, and, and trying to keep track is, is hard. The other group that's super important is the prioritization working group. And these essentially make sure that uh, critical or important issues get handled quickly, and they get seen by the right people. So every week, we have a compiler team, weekly meeting, and the prioritization working group uh, makes the agenda and makes sure that um, issues get put on it. But what if you don't want to code and you want to try to be innovative? And I just want to say these are a little bit of my thoughts, but um, it's things I, I'd love to see. So the first thing is I think the, the project has a huge gap in, in project management, right? So it, it'd be awesome to have someone that can come in and help make sure the features keep moving, that old features aren't forgotten. And the, the teams that are in charge of these features do sometimes go through them, but uh, it can take a while. And it can be helpful to have someone that you know pokes people and, and checks in on things. The other thing that project management uh, it would be useful for is to help teams keep track of and document decisions, right? So as I said, the compiler team has weekly meetings, but other teams like the types and libs team have regular meetings and ling team. And having some, um, someone to help keep track of decisions could be helpful. The other thing that, um, you know, there's a few people here that are uh, involved in it is the academic side of Rust, right? And thinking about not just the compiler, but uh, you know, proving out that the trait system works or safety of Rust. And um, there's been more and more work going on, but I think um, there's always more that can be done. And so that leaves sort of the final question here. So what do you do after you've contributed? You contribute more. Thanks. And I will take any questions.